What's up, RPG people? This is BardicCollege.com. Today, we are talking hex crawls. I spent the last three months playing nothing but hex crawls because I was interested in learning how the old games were played and how the old stories were told. And I felt the hex crawling would be a good first step. It's a technique that existed actually before role playing even began back in 1972. So it's an interesting concept. It was actually first. Uh, an overland movement game where it was a simulation of trying to survive in the wilderness. Those rules then carried over into Gary Gygax and Dave Arnison's Dungeons and Dragons as, you know, a good way of moving across the map. Um, it was kind of put off to the side and the modules then started to really focus in on developing storylines. And I thought that was kind of strange. Why didn't this technique continue on with the rest of the games? Because hex crawling as a tool for overland movement and telling a story is so different from the way that we're used to, I would consider it to be an advanced technique, but well worth getting into. There are some challenges that come with it, and I'm going to go over those right now. Challenge number one is going to be preparing the hex crawl. Now, we're all used to, in traditional adventures, reading through the entire book, understanding everything in detail before presenting it to the players. Not so with a hex crawl, because a hex crawl has been set up in a different way. When you're looking at the map that's provided, it has a grid system and usually a coordinate system to identify all the various hexes on it. Each one has an individual name. All right, so some of those hexes are going to be keyed, meaning they contain a paragraph of information further on in the book that explains uh, details and, and so on that the dungeon master can then build off from. The problem with this is that the keyed hex areas are disassociated from each other, meaning that there is no connection or plotline that the players can follow in order to progress the story forward until the storyteller has made that. But we'll get into that in just a little bit. The next thing uh, that you have to prepare for is where the characters are going to start the adventure, right? So you're looking at the map, and any place as good as any other, but there is a storytelling method we call the Green Hill Zone, right? And it's very common in video games. The Green Hill Zone is an idyllic starting location for players. It's typified by having good access to resources and low threat levels. And the reason that you want to start them off in a place like this is because hex crawling is probably going to be new for them, and you should make navigation easy, make logistics easy, make random encounters easy, so that they understand basically what they're up against before they get into the advanced nitty gritty later on. Now this is just a generalized game designing principle, right? You don't have to do it like this. Your map might, might even not have green hill zones in it, but you have to figure out what is the relative green hill zone for you. All right, challenge number two is going to be preparing your players for the hex crawl. It's probably going to be new for them, so you want to give them some advice, maybe through the mouths of NPCs and so on. But they're going to be running into situations that require different kinds of equipment they're not used to using. Um, they're going to be up against weather and navigation and bigger random encounters. And lastly, logistics. They're going to be rationing. They might have to go out and hunt, pick berries, you know. They may not necessarily have that routine down yet. So you want to get them prepared. Chekhov's gun is a good trope to use to prepare your players for the overland adventure they're about to have. You might want to set, you know, start talking about a specific piece of equipment, maybe like a spyglass or a special kind of compass or, you know, parchment and ink, you know, because these are things that they might not ever think about and they're going to need it for this kind of adventure. Challenge number three is going to be mapping. Now, mapping is the namesake of the hex crawling technique, so it's really important for you to spend some time figuring out just how you want to portray the story of Overland Adventure. The question for me was mechanics or story? What's more important and how do I want the players to interface with that? The story that I wanted to tell was of exploring the unknown. To do this, I separated the players from the hex crawling mechanics completely. The biggest step I took in this regard was to give the players their own map and hold on to the hex map for the dungeon master only. The map that the players made was just a blank sheet of paper, and I had them draw in the map freehand style. If they got lost, there was no way that they could calculate just by hexes how off course they had become. Challenge number four is going to be random encounters. Now, in a hex crawl, random encounters are a completely different animal. For one, you're moving across a much bigger map. And time doesn't work quite the same way. You're not really worried about rounds and turns, you're worried about hours and days. Not only does time and space work differently on a hex crawl, 
but you also need to be prepared to deal with threats of higher level. And the reason for that is that the authors that write these modules tend to assume that you're going to be a higher level if you're on a hex map. Adjust the story, not the stat block. That's a design principle I learned along the way of running these hex crawls. You see, as storytellers, I think that we want to protect the players from any unbalanced encounters. And what you will run into in a hex crawl is a very high level of threat, right? Because typically the number of monsters encountered is going to be higher. The level of threat those each individual monster has is going to be higher. You also have opportunities, better opportunities to flee, to recruit other forces to assist in defending against these particular threats. So you really are more efficient adjusting the storyline to fit the encounter than you are getting into the nitty gritty of the mechanics of the stat blocks and so on. Challenge number five is going to be storytelling. So storytelling for a hex crawl is going to be a very different process than you're used to. For one, an adventure path is a series of plot connected points that you move the players through in order to reach a conclusion. There is no such plot connection in a hex crawl. They provide you with a map, and that map is a hex grid. Some of those hexes are going to be populated with detailed information. The detailed information consists maybe of a paragraph, and that's all you have to work with. There is no interconnections or plot lines available to move the players through. That is determined by the players, because the way that your players interact with those plot points, or I should say with those keyed hexes, is going to create the plot that the characters then drive. Now, there are a handful of tools that I have discovered to be crucial to telling a story in a hex crawl. The first of these is going to be map handouts. So imagine that your dungeon master is going to have his map, and it's going to be the hex map where he's tracking where everybody's going and so on. And then the players have their hand-drawn map of where they think they are and what they know is to be ahead of them and so on and so forth. We'll then introduce now the map handouts, where maybe they discover an NPC who's willing to give them a treasure map, you know, and but it's going to be something hand-drawn, hastily scrawled, and it's going to be, it's not going to have any scale to it, it's not going to have any measurements or distances, right? It's just a hand-drawn map that gives them an idea of where this thing is. This introduces mystery and frontier exploration, right? Because since they don't know where a thing is exactly, they have to explore to find it. The next thing you're going to want is hex graph paper. And the reason for that is eventually you're going to want to zoom in on a single hex and expand the detail within it. In order to do that, you're going to have to break that one hex into smaller subhexes in order to fill in the detail and keep the hex scale in mind. Next is a hex crawling reference. So I find that this product really expands on the information that's missing in many of the core books. Even 5th edition doesn't really include a lot of information on how to do overland travel, and things like this will fill in the gaps there. The last tool I have to recommend to you, and I consider these to be essential to running any kind of hex crawl or sandbox game, these are adventure creation books. Now, what's in them is essentially just tons of random tables, right? But when you're running a hex crawl, everything has to be on the fly. There's no way you can really prepare for what players are going to do or be forced to do, right? And so books like these help you make that up on the fly, and it reduces the amount of time that you have to think about things. You just roll some stuff up and you just go with it, man, you know? And it's really fun and essential, like I said. All right, RPG people, that concludes this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful, hopefully. Comment down below. Let's keep talking about it. I will be making more of these videos. We'll be talking about more than just hex crawling. We'll be going into dungeon crawling and sandboxing and all different kinds of storytelling techniques. So like and subscribe. Stay tuned. Uh, this is Bardic College reminding you, don't just play a game. Tell a great story.